I think we all know that vanity is not a good quality. Nobody's navel is that interesting. Mine is dull as hell. But if you're the kind of guy who's going to go around knocking people off and somehow getting away with it just because a piece of decorative artwork will magically take the fall for you, decorative artwork. Price is Right fans will get that one. Long time older Price is Right fans will get that one. Then you probably need a good beverage in your hand while you're looking at the monstrosity of what you've become. The picture might show all of your awfulness, but Spark Plug Coffee is all about awesomeness. This great product that will be delivered to Canadians and Americans within a week ain't nothing but the freshest, fairly traded, premium Arabica brand of beans you'll find in Canada. Spark Plug can provide half calf or decaf, if that's your thing, and they've got all kinds of blends and roasts. Seasonal blends even rotate on their menu. Did I mention that Canadians get their orders shipped for free? Well, they do. So that's great. But what's even greater is being a member of Spark Plug's Autopilot Coffee Club. That will snag you deals and other perks that people born in 1800s England can only dream of. And as a member, you will save money every time you place an order. You can also customize to get your orders when it suits your pleasure-seeking life. But don't think of this as a coffee of the month club. You handsome people need to type sparkplug.coffee slash H-Y-E-S into your device. If you haven't taken advantage of the 20% off deal before, you can with your next order. So 20% off by using our H-Y-E-S promo code. Put that in the appropriate promo box. So that's that for the sales portion of the show. I need to tell you now about a crappy man and his evil exploits. And action! Have you ever seen... The Picture of Dorian Gray. Hey there, movie monkeys, and thanks for making the 565th snapshot of Have You Ever Seen a Part of Your Day. This podcast trundles back into the past and reviews classic films that can be found there and we spoiled the ever-loving out of them. I'm your dreamboat host with a scary painting locked away in a forbidden room, Ryan Ellis. Only neither of those things are true. I'm no dreamboat, and I have very few paintings in this house, and none of them are scary. This will be a monologue today. My wife Bev is never in the podcast room on Fridays. Her not being here allows me to speculate that maybe she's hidden her own freaky-deaky picture somewhere in a place in this house. I'll have to ask her and get back to you on that. If she does have one, I'm sure she'll tell me. So anyway, when I review films on my own, I inch my way through the plot, toss up a bunch of asides along the way, and try to get some smiles out of you by indulging in some tomfoolery. Let's set the table then. So Portrait of a Bad Man was released by MGM on March 3rd, 1945. This film has great numbers on Rotten Tomatoes. 93% of critics like it, with an average of 8 out of 10. There are only 15 reviews on the site though, so it's not a huge sample size. The audiences on that website are not as enamored with Albert Lewin's motion picture as the critics are. 77% of them say, see it, people. That's not bad, but not as good as 93%, because I could do math. The Pick of Doors won an Oscar. That was for Harry Stradling Sr.'s black and white cinematography. Of course, there are infamous moments in color at key points in this flick, but otherwise, this is a lustrous film that was shot in the black and the white. Great use of shadows, too. The Flickety Flick was also nominated for Best Supporting Actress and Best Black and White Art Direction Interior Decoration. Angela Lansbury was that supporting actress, while five guys, including Cedric Gibbons, were up for their sets. Lansbury won the Golden Globe for Best Supporting Actress for her work in this, but Anne Revere won the Oscar for her performance in National Velvet, which Lansbury was also in. Fittingly, Mr. Gray was nominated for the American Film Institute's Top 50 Villains on the Heroes and Villains list. He didn't make it, but he's enough of a jerk face that he was worthy. But the number one reason I even chose to cover this is because the flick made its way onto AFI's Top 100 Thrills. It was 86th. There are only about a dozen movies that made the throws list that we haven't yet covered, and we're probably going to get to some of them this year, including Dial M for Murder, that'll probably be pretty soon, and the 1962 version of Cape Fear, catching up on my Mitchum if we get to that one. We hadn't really ever covered him before a couple years ago, and we did Night of the Hunter last year. All right, what's this thriller all about? It's 1886, and our story is set in London. Wait, England? No one told me Dorian Gray was a limey. All right, I'll let that go. I'll keep somewhat calm, and I'll soldier on. Sorry, London people, if I didn't have a fun little shot at you there. Take a fun little shot of you there. Anyway, George Sanders is Lord Henry Watton, who shows up at his buddy Basil Hallward's crib and catches sight of a portrait Basil is just finishing. Lowell Gilmore plays Basil. Watton says it's great, although we don't see his artwork just yet. You can guess who the subject of the painting is. I'm not going to give you any odds on that. You better get it. If you don't, get out of here. The two guys verbally joust for a bit, and during this, Basil volunteers the information that something comes over him when he paints Dorian Gray. Well, this film is supernatural and has a pretty fantastical premise, so why not? Oh, and even though Sanders' name in the credits is Henry, a lot of the characters call him Harry. I never got how Harry comes from Henry. 
Although, come to think of it, isn't Prince Harry's actual name Henry? Herd Hatfield is our man Dorian, who shows up without us really noticing him and starts playing Basil's piano. He's not as good as Chico Marx, but his tinkling does sound pretty good. We heard Chico Marx last week, watching Horse Feathers. I get the feeling somebody else played the notes and he just mimicked the music with his hands. You don't see, I don't think, ever a close-up or a wide shot even more so with him playing the instrument. Chico Marx played it, though. Lord Watton lays a nice bit of foreshadowing on us by telling everyone there that people should exercise their every instinct. If it feels good, do it. Also, he tells Dorian that there's only one thing in the world worth having, and that is youth. Watton is reading Gray's mind without even realizing it and telling him exactly what he wants to hear. He'd fit in so well these days. Are you telling me what I want to hear? Then you're good. If you don't, you're terrible. Basil's niece Gladys shows up and he lets her doodle her name on the bottom corner of the painting. So we do see this thing a little bit in this shot. Oh, wait, here we go. I saw this movie once a very long time ago, and I keep saying this lately on this channel. I didn't remember the details, so it felt like seeing the movie mostly fresh. The point is, I figured we weren't going to actually see the portrait for a while, but then we do, and it's in full Technicolor. This is a black and white film, like I said, but there are four instances of Technicolor. I think it's four, and it always involves the painting, although that's often shown in black and white, too. More often than not, you see it in black and white, at least in the background and such, but when they have nice big close-ups, especially when things go crazy towards the middle and the end of this, Technicolor. DG laments that, as I grow old, this picture will remain young. Then, if only the picture could change, and I could remain young. He'd give his soul for it. What he needs right now is a Zoltar machine, so he can make a wish and turn into a childlike corporate executive named Tom Hanks. He doesn't have the Zoltar, but a cat statue in Basil's place in the middle of the room does grant the wish. Albert Lewin directed this film with a lot of restraint, and this is a good example. He doesn't have an overbearing music cue or zooms into the cat's face to make it 100% clear of what's going on here. It's obviously fantastical and even a little silly, but he does not turn it into such a big moment that we can't take it seriously. By the way, Herd Hatfield is a good-looking guy, but I don't think he's worth all this hype. Too bad MGM couldn't have scored a young Monty Cliff to play this character. He was worth the handsome hype, especially in the first five or six years of his career before that accident. Maybe a little longer than five or six, but he had that bad accident, messed up his looks. But Monty was still a few years away from being a Hollywood actor anyway, so I guess it's pointless to say they should have tried to get him when they didn't even know his name yet. I think it was 48 was his first year of movies. The Search was that year, I think, and also Red River, which we've covered. Angela Lansbury sings her way into the movie at this point, playing Sybil Vane. She's not someone in her mid-60s warbling, Beauty and the Beast. But the lady can, in fact, carry a tune. Dorian takes a liking to the ingenue who sings, Goodbye, Little Yellow Bird, partly because a dude is tossing feathers over her every couple of seconds. What a value add. It's messy, but it provides value. Dorian gets to go backstage to see her after the show, I guess because he's such a flawless dreamboat, and he's rich. He asks Sybil to sing Goodbye, Little Yellow Bird for him personally, but she won't be some trained chimp unless she pays for the encore. In that case, she's happy to be a chimp. And luckily enough, Gray himself can play the piano, as we saw at Baswell's earlier, so he works the keys while she trills for him. He again laments about losing his youth, so she kisses him. Ange can certainly sell that she's into somebody with all her heart, which is a good job here. Although she later says to her brother that there's no evil in him, so she will eventually prove to be an absolutely terrible judge of character. Dorian and Lord Watton show up for a formal dinner with pompous rich people named Lady Agatha and Sir Thomas. Sanders proves, as he would in All About Eve, that he can really sell a wordy line. He's quite the sinister philosopher. After dinner, Dorian tells Harry Henry, when they're outside alone, that he's engaged. In these old movies, people work fast. I saw her. I liked her. I wanted to get to bumping. So let's get married! Basil and Henry aren't impressed by his choice of future bride, but the Lord predicts this won't last long anyway. Reminder... This film wasn't on the top 100 passions, it was on the top 100 thrills. And we will get to those heart pounders, right now we're heart thumping. Dorian, Basil, and Harry Henry enjoy some beers before the older men get a chance to meet their chum's fiancé. I thought we were going to get a scene with Sybil and all the men together, but no, oh, as they're about to sit down, it fades out. Back home we get a meta moment when Dorian reads to Sybil a passage from a poem by Oscar Wilde, and it's meta because Oscar Wilde wrote the book that Albert Lewin adapted into this screenplay. It's 2 a.m. and the Sibs is ready to go home, but Gray wants her to stay. She starts to head out, even though it's in a proper English way. He seems to be saying, if you don't put out, then get out. For good. For good, my dear. He goes back to some aggressive piano playing, only to have her return to the room with a sad look on her face. I guess he gets what he wants after this, but her agreeing to do it makes her lesser than in his aristocratic eyes. Hypocrite. Well, villain's got a villain. The next scene has Dorian writing a kiss-off letter to Miss Vane, saying he only wants to live for pleasure and he's leaving England to do it. It's actually interesting how similar this vicious letter is to what Brad Pitt dictates in his letter to Julia Ormond in Legends of the Fall. 
He didn't actually write the things Pitt says we hear in voiceover. It was just something about, I am dead, marry another. That's what we actually see in the letter. But we know what he meant was, kiss off, it's over. We see all kinds of visuals. He's had all these explanations about how, oh my God, I can't live with myself. I can't be with you. I want to, but I can't. That stuff. The letter's very simple though, kiss off. And what was his character's name? Tristan, which is the name of the character in a picture Sybil has on her wall and what she earlier called Dorian, St. Tristan. The Greyster goes home, not feeling all that good about what he did to Sybil, and catches a glimpse of the infamous painting, which has slightly changed. It's in the expression. The mouth looks meaner. Specifically, there are lines of cruelty above the mouth. That's what the narration says. None of what shows up on his actual face. After going to sleep, he comes back down to find that, yep, he wasn't imagining it. The painting looks different. His conscience has been made visible, as the voiceover also says. The D-man decides to write another letter, this time trying to get Sybil back. His emotions are all over the place even though he never shows any emotions. Hurt Hatfield really is asked to play it very close to the best in this performance. I wouldn't say he does that remarkably well. He's okay at best in this. Harry Henry shows up and flatly reveals that Sybil is dead. She swallowed something, according to Watton. Wow, Lansbury was pretty good in her few scenes in this flick, but she got an Oscar nomination for this performance? It's such a brief and, yes, impactful role, but a war-worthy? Slow year for Best Supporting Actress? Mr. Gray accurately blames himself for her death, but the Lord sloughs it off. What a giant prick. Watton doesn't give any kind of fig about the dead singer. She meant nothing to him in life. She means nothing to him in death. He really is playing Addison DeWitt in All About Eve before he actually did play Addison DeWitt in All About Eve. Now that he knows she's gone, Dorian tosses his Take Me Back letter into the fire. We don't see his face or the painting's face, but I'm sure one of them, probably the paintings, would have revealed some serious verklempness. Basil comes over and wants to see his picture because he intends to put it in an exhibit, but Dorian absolutely, positively forbids it. The painted will never speak to the painter again if he doesn't obey. Basil lets the matter go, but now we've got our thrills finally coming into play. Dorian has got to keep his friends from ever seeing this evolving snapshot of his inner ugliness. He has his servants put the picture in a room upstairs, a room that happens to be his childhood bedroom. He doesn't spend time here anymore, but his old toys sure do. Those in his now ever-worsening picture. And our dog, Fox, long dead, would have loved to be in that room all day long with those dilly. Years pass and Dorian never ages. People are amazed by this, but he's a rich man, so they mostly just treat him like they always did. I knew Donna Reed was in this, and now we finally meet her. She's Basil's niece, Gladys. She's the grown-up version of the little girl who came in and doodled her name on the painting. The very next scene, after a brief one between Reed and Hatfield, is her talking to her uncle Basil about getting married. What do we miss? She's going to marry the guy? Of course, this is a movie about vanity. Maybe she just wants the hottie. Supposed hottie. Oh, and the rich guy. Let's not forget he has money. Peter Lawford plays David Stone, a young man hoping to win Gladys's affections. He tries to get into the room where the painting is, but Dorian has the only key. Hell, we heard him say earlier that he was going to fire the two servants who helped him put the picture up in the bedroom in the first place. So you know he's not going to let anyone else have any kind of access. The ageless one runs into Basil while both are out walking on a foggy night. The B-man tries to let the D-man know that people are talking. People will talk. A lot of dead people have turned up. Guys have committed suicide. Certain gentlemen even leave the room when the pleasure-seeking eternal youth guy walks in. The Doors is barely interested in any of this, but does sit up straight after Basil talks about wanting to see his soul. Surprisingly, Dorian takes Basil up to that room to indeed show the painter the soul of the painted. And since the always-changing picture reveals all the crappy things Gray has thought, said, or done, this thing now looks horrible. It's not scary enough to keep you up at night, but when we see the full-color insert of the painting as it looks now, it's pretty horrifying. The music stinger helps sell the moment, too. I can believe that people might have screamed in terror back in 1945. If they did now, that would be a little bit silly, but 1945? I could see that. Dory Dor tells Basil about the wish he made way back when, and that he lied about destroying the painting. And because Dorian can't allow Basil to ever tell Gladys about any of this, he just up and stabs the man in the back. Literally. Even though the recording I made off TCM was making a weird audio popping sound at this point, and had been for a while, I love the sound of the overhead light that's swinging back and forth after getting smacked during the skirmish. The lighting in the scene is wonderful too, so kudos to Straddling for the look and the audio team for the metallic sound effects of that swinging light. This is the best scene in the whole movie, I think. And after Gray's latest misadventure, the full-color painting has some fresh blood on the forehead and also on the right hand. This thing keeps up on current events. That just happened. Dorian is in luck because no one will suspect him of killing Basil because the guy was supposed to go to Paris on a late train and there were no witnesses to see him come into Gray's house. Dorian leaves the body where it is and recruits an old friend named Alan Campbell to help him cover up the evil doings even simply admitting that he killed the picture maker. Dorian blackmails Alan into helping cover up the killing. So now this vicious bastard has a sad ally in Alan, and this isn't going to end well. Of course, many years have passed since the movie started, and while Dorian doesn't age, 
Lord Watton does. The makeup team put some pretty convincing gray into Sanders' hair and beard. I read a trivia entry, or maybe a goof entry, about how other people don't age, and I didn't really notice that so much, but Sanders is on screen so much, and he actually does look relatively convincingly older, about, what is it, 20 years or so, a little more than that? We're back at a fancy dinner, and even though David Stone can't hide his jealousy, Dorian asks Gladys to marry him. She's in. Months pass, and no one can find out what happened to Basil. Gladys is distraught, but she's also looking pretty boss in a fancy hat and a tremendous fur that goes nearly all the way to the ground. Dorian and his fiancée find out at this point that Alan killed himself, and no one knows why he would do that. Well, except Dorian and us. Some guy in the street is preaching to a group of people asking, What profit a man who gains the whole world but loses his soul? That's in the Bible, right? I think it is. Well, it is a preacher saying it, so I guess it must be in the Bible. Well, there's this movie in a nutshell. What profit a man who gains the whole world loses his soul? Although I have a better one. So, the picture of Dorian Gray in a nutshell. Paul Rudd, only not an SOB. Aren't people always saying Rudd never ages? They seem to be right. The picture of Paul Rudd, or the picture of Keanu Reeves. Part of the preacher's audience is Sybil's brother, James Vane. He's still devastated about his sister's suicide, even though it's been a few decades. He thinks Sir Tristan is responsible. Tristan remembers what Sybil called Dorian, but he doesn't know who the actual person is. He never got a real name out of Sybil. As luck would have it, or maybe clumsy writing would have it, another guy in the bar calls Dorian that exact Sir Tristan name. So now James is on the hunt to kill a killer. He gives up when he sees what appears to be a young man in front of him, who we know has looked 22 for 22 or so years. People really do take this in stride, though, that this guy is not aged. Dorian ends up on a train with Lord Watton, who gets to deliver what should have been an AFI-nominated quote. To get back my youth, I'd do anything in the world, except get up early, take exercise, or be respectable. I <laughs> love that one. They also spend a little time musing about what happened to Basil, and the elephant in the room fact that Dorian never ages. Harry Henry is a detached lout, but he really does slough off that a guy he's known for decades doesn't look at all different decades after he met him. Meantime, David reveals to Gladys and Watton that he tried to find out what Dorian has in that infamous room. Servants who had been fired by Gray and then came to David for a job revealed to him that they were turfed because they were accused of spying. David manages to break into the bedroom and finds the hideous painting. When he says that the modern Gladys' signature matches the one he saw in the painting, she's, well, mildly concerned. I'm a Donna Reed fan, but she's pretty bland in this movie. It's not her best work. She looks fantastic, of course, and I love her outfits in a couple of her scenes. This flick was probably worthy of an Oscar nomination for the costumes, actually. Didn't get it. We find out that James has ended up dead now, too. I don't think Freddy Krueger was responsible for so much death. Not all of it is because of Dorian, but he's certainly to blame in some way for a lot of it. The dude goes up to see his painting and considers changing his ways, thinking that will maybe erase the evil in the picture, or maybe he'll destroy the thing altogether. Even though what he does next is pretty cool, I didn't buy that he would have a change of heart like this. He's done a lot of bad things and has never shown almost any emotion about any of it. Why does he care now? But what is cool is that he stabs the portrait right in the heart, and like Tomax or Zamot from G.I. Joe, he feels the effects of the knife that didn't even touch him, and he collapses. As Dorian dies of the stab wound, the painting goes back to the way it was when Basil first conjured it up. We're in big-time fantasy territory now, although I think it's an effective ending, even if I question that this turd claims out of nowhere to not want to be a turd anymore. Watton and David break into the room just as Dorian falls to the ground, only to find the painting looking all snazzy again, while Dorian looks truly terrible on the floor. They did a great makeup job on Herd Hatfield here. He looks gruesome. And again, 1945, I can see people shrieking in terror at this moment. As for the picture, they can't even sell the thing now because it has a big hole in the middle of it. I also wonder what Harry Henry and David will tell people what happened. Everyone knew Dorian was a very young man. Who is this monstrous creature who will end up on the morgue? How do they explain this? Who's going to believe about how the painting and this man shared a transference? Reasonably good question. That's actually a pretty good question. Man, it was a pretty good question, don't you think? Made me think to beat the band. So the cast. Actually, in honor of English people, I'll say, so the cost. George Sanders is top build, even though he's not the main character and he's certainly not the title character. George's resume is littered with impressive titles, including a couple Hitchcock projects that got released in 1940. Foreign correspondent and the Best Picture winner, Rebecca. He went on to win an Oscar for that wonderfully caustic supporting work in All About Eve five years later. Georgie Boy also had fun playing Mr. Freeze on the Batman TV series in the 60s, and he was the voice of Shere Khan in the 1967 animated blockbuster version of The Jungle Book. The man had a tremendous career. Hurt Hatfield was making only his second movie here. He later did things like The Left-Handed Gun and The Boston Strangler, plus he played Pontius Pilate in King of Kings 16 years after this came out, and did another period epic that same year, El Cid, a Charlton Heston film. Donna Reed was a year away from playing Mary Bailey, Mary Bailey, 
in It's a Wonderful Life and eight years away from winning an Oscar for her supporting work in From Here to Be Eternity. She's far better in both of those than she is in this. But someone who was good, Angela Lansbury, is so well known for playing Jessica Fletcher on Murder, She Wrote and for being the voice of Mrs. Potts in Beauty and the Beast. But a lot of people won't know that she was nominated for three Oscars in the early days of her career way back at this point. And interestingly, the other two nominations were for flicks that also made the AFI's throws list, Gaslight and The Great Manchurian Candidate. You better believe we covered that. The Lands never won a competitive Oscar, although she should have for The Manchurian Candidate, where she's so awesome as Mrs. Iceland, but they gave her an honorary Oscar 10 years ago in 2014, and she died a couple of Octobers ago, 2022. Lowell Gilmore is Basil. He'd made his first movie just a year before. He was also in King Solomon's Mines in 1950, and a Western later in the 50s called Saskatchewan. I only point that out because I had no idea one of our least famous provinces had a movie named after it. Alan Ladd and Shelley Winters are both in it, and geez, it made over two million bucks. So it wasn't something that should be so unknown to me. I tried to seek it out, actually, after looking up on this on YouTube, and it's there, but it's stretched out. I don't like that. I want to see it in the proper aspect ratio. I want to see faces look like they've been pulled apart, like that scene in Brazil. Rat Packer Peter Lawford was naturally in the original Ocean's Eleven with his fellow Rat Pack boys, so Sinatra and Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr., but was also part of the ensemble in The Longest Day. Pete was in a lot of motion pictures back in the 40s, actually. There's some pretty reputable titles on his resume, but especially back in those early days of his career. Cedric Hardwick is the narrator. I thought for a while it might be Sanders' voice because that would have made some sense, but realized after a while it had to be someone else, and it was. Hardwick had a big year a little over a decade later in 1956. He was in the monster hit The Ten Commandments, we covered that, but also the Best Picture winner, Around the World in 80 Days. We haven't covered that. But before that, he joined Sanders in the Hitchcock Parade by working with him on Suspicion and Rope. Hitchcock, not Sanders, he worked with there. Their director and writer was Albert Lewin, he wrote and produced movies a lot more often than he directed them, though. In fact, he only helmed six other movies and was fired off one of them. That was Madame Curie in 1943. Lewin was given the task of adapting Oscar Wilde's 1890s novel about Dorian Gray into a screenplay, and he was a scriptwriting machine over the years, getting started during the silent era. Since I'm planning to cover our first ever Ava Gardner movie late in February, I've been curious to see some of the other things she did. One of them is Pandora and the Flying Dutchman, which was directed by Albert Lewin. His credits include being an associate producer on Mutiny on the Bounty, which we've covered, and The Lady Eve, which we've also covered. In fact, I saw that again recently. I laughed my head off even more this time, maybe, certainly as much as I have before. I saw it on the Criterion channel, which is also where I saw Pandora and The Flying Dutchman. Because the picture of Dorian Gray was an MGM production, there are many well-known names and important behind-the-scenes jobs. Pandro Berman produced it, while Ferris Webster cut it. Webster was the great editor on The Magnificent Seven and The Great Escape. Herbert Stothert came up with a music score. He worked on The Wizard of Oz quite a few years before this, and we've covered The Seven, The Escape, and The Oz, so look for those reviews in our archives. Mag 7 was our focus just a few months ago. Incidentally, this isn't the only version of this story that's been filmed over the years. There are at least a half dozen entries in the IMDb when you type in Dorian Gray. There was a British TV movie in 1973, and then Josh Dumel starred in a version in 2005. And there was just Dorian Gray, with Ben Barnes and Colin Firth back in 2009, that was probably the most successful of the remakes. It pulled in nearly 23 million smackers. That may not be much, but it looks like that's more than what the other remakes made. Obviously, a TV movie like the 73 version can't make that much money because it was on TV. Well, I'd say I like this movie just fine. This makes two viewings, though, and maybe that's enough. I didn't love Heard Hatfield's performance, and I certainly felt like Donna Reed was, well, pretty bad. Sanders is having fun, though, and he gets some great dialogue. Richard Fraser and Douglas Walton play Glum quite well in their brief screen time as James Vane and Alan Campbell. They were two of the better things in this whole movie, actually. And Lansbury was quite good in her small role. Not Oscar-worthy, but pretty good. The reason to see this is for the look, the design, and that effective use of color when we see the painting at key moments. As for the thrill sides of this thing, there's a growing horror, especially when we see just how awful Dorian has become. Most of his crappy deeds happen off-screen, so we have to use our imaginations. But Basil's murder is an excellent scene. But yeah, this vampire story which is what this is, in a way, is a solid film at the very least. Obviously, film companies agree because they keep remaking it. So that was how I saw the picture of Dorian Gray. In two weeks, we'll be nine days into February. For the third straight year, we're making the Valentine's Month all about love stories. The first time we did a theme like that back in 2022 was called The Month of Strange Love. Then last year, it was Crazy Stupid Love Month. This year, it's Love in a Word, because all the lovey-dovey flicks will be one-word titles. And my solo show on February 9th will be a fantastic flick made by a man many don't think is so fantastic. I'm talking about Woody Allen and one of his two or three best films, Manhattan. If hearing about that guy disgusts you, no trouble. Join us on the channel for some other episode. 
For those who are curious about Manhattan, I'll focus on what he created in that true classic while also spending a little time addressing his real-life controversies. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I'll definitely talk about it. As for when Bev is back in this room with me, that'll be in three days when we review Steven Soderbergh's debut film and our final choice in this year's month of Bev, Sex Lies and Videotape. Tell us what you thought of this podcast or any other one we've done. Our email is haveyouevereseenpodcast at gmail.com. One long thing with the at. Our Twitex handles are at moviefiend51 and at Bev Ellis Ellis. And she's on threads at Bev Ellis Ellis. I haven't gone to threads yet. Maybe I will someday. We keep on posting our full shows on YouTube. There's not much to see, but it's an easy way to listen to the podcast if you're having trouble with your app or don't have Wi-Fi on your phone, but do have internet access. That's happened to me when trying to listen to other people's podcasts. So the place to go is at H-Y-E-S Ellis in your browser or type Have You Ever Seen into the search bar when you're on YouTube or if you know the specific episode you want to listen to, Have You Ever Seen Picture of Dorian Gray, Manhattan, whatever, then you obviously get that episode specifically. Radar podcast, write a review, comment, like, and please subscribe. Just do all that lovely stuff. And fill your mug with spark plug coffee. You'll get that 20% discount I talked about at the top of the show by using our H-Y-E-S promo code. So it's sparkplug.coffee slash H-Y-E-S in your search bar. So that's that. Thanks a bunch for spending a bit of time with me on this day. Join us on Monday when we look at some sex, some lies, and some videotape. Meantime, I'm going to go see if that hideous painting of me looks any worse today. It might. I had some stern feelings about several people a few hours ago, so maybe the thing will be an even more colorful cesspool in my black and white world. And cut.